Welcome to the Trinity Podcast. My name is Joel Milligan, and we want to help everyday people discover an extraordinary life with God. And this podcast's mission is really to dig deeper into maybe conversations and messages that you may hear on the weekend if you're part of our church family, or if you listen regularly, we have different topics uh, from scripture, different eternal truths that we talk about, how to apply them to the everyday moments of life. And I'm always privileged to be joined here on the podcast by some really smart people, uh, right? Yes. Okay. They're, they're we'll take fun. it. <laughs> <laughs> no, just, I just ask the questions and all the wisdom flows <laughs> from, from this way. So we're, we're joined by Daniel Riddick, Tommy Carr, and Daniel Warren. Uh, they are all pastors on staff here at Trinity. So we're going to start today a little bit different with some listener feedback. I love that. All right. That's great. There are people that listen to this. Listeners. There are listeners <laughs> and they want to get feedback. <laughs> no, it's We're always... pastors, so we are no stranger Ooh. to listener feedback. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the, the shaking the hand at the door when they walk yeah, out on right. Sunday. Yeah. Yes. Or more than that. More, more than, than that. that. Okay. More than that. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, anytime you all want to send feedback uh, about uh, how this podcast is a blessing to you, it's actually an encouragement to us because we're recording this in kind of like a vacuum. We have no studio mm -hmm. audience. Uh, so it's good to hear from you and really good to see how uh, this is being a blessing to you. I have a friend out in Oklahoma that messaged me, Oklahoma. Uh, he always sends me pictures of different tornadoes that he sees. And that really like, I want to see a tornado in real life. I don't so know. You're it's a, like a, you're a space guy. He's a weather guy. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. Uh, but he sh just shot me a quick message and said the episode about walking with God with Felicia Perry um, was just outstanding. Mm. And it was such an encouragement to him to see how just radiant of a believer uh, mm. Felicia was, if you remember that. I do. Yeah. Uh, a couple of weeks ago. And then had uh, someone else message me, and I'll just, I'll read it verbatim because it's so good. Uh, he's been listening to the podcast. He said, over the years, Trinity has had such an impact on me. And I'm so grateful that today's technology allows for that to continue. I'm always refreshed and encouraged when I listen to you guys. Thanks again for the podcast. Loved every episode. Oh. Wow. Now, here's what's weird. I just got one on the way here. Really? I just got one from a local pastor. He said two things stood out about the last podcast y'all did, just about the washing of the feet. I mean, it was just, he said, I am enjoying the podcast immensely. So yeah, it's great feedback. That's awesome. Yeah. Very encouraging. Yeah. So feel free to comment below or shoot a message or whatever, uh, however you're listening or watching today. Well, we're in a series, uh, Love One Another, just mm -hmm. kicked it off um, here at our church. Uh, so we're we're in John, we're in John 13 and 15, and we're going to be in a couple of different places. But I thought I would start off with this and kind of throw it out to you all. You all. So just this past week, um, as we were talking about loving one another and loving your neighbor as yourself, um, literally two days ago, actually it was on Monday, um, I, my neighbor came and knocked on my door. And I, he's, I've known him for seven years. He lives a couple of houses over. And he's like, he had his dog with him. He's like, hey, man, um, I don't know why, but there's my, my lawn guys over there mowing my yard right now. And he's like, I'm going to tell him to come mow your yard. First of all, I'm like, man, he must think my yard looks really bad. <laughs> <laughs> but he's like, I just, I, I just want to be a blessing to you. I'm like, what? wait, what? And he's like, no, my, my lawn guys over there, I'll pay for it. I'll ask him how much. And I want him to come do your front and backyard. Now I love doing, doing the lawn. It's like therapeutic for me, but I've been so busy. I haven't had a chance to do it uh, here lately. It's been raining so much. Yeah. And, um, it was just a random act of kindness, a picture of just caring about your neighbor. And he sent his lawn guy over mowed, weed eated, blew off my driveway. It was just the coolest blessing from just my neighbor saying, Hey, yeah. I want to be a blessing yeah. to you. Uh, so I'll throw that out to you all. What, what's something someone has done for you, a random act of kindness, something where you're just like, man, that just really met a need in my life that I didn't even know I had or didn't even ask to be met? Yeah, you know, uh, last week for us, actually, it's funny you asked this question. Uh, we've got, obviously, just amazing people in our church that always kind of respond in these kinds of ways. But we had a lady in the church on two Sundays ago, and she came up and said, hey, I just want you to know, I know Wednesday, and really she was thinking about my wife 
who's a teacher, she said, mm -hmm. I know it's the first day of school. She said, so I've got dinner and everything provided for your whole family on Wednesday night. I'm going to bring it by. And Man, I was just what? like, that's awesome. Wow. Thank yeah. you. You know, and it, it is one yeah. of those deals where you just, what you just said, didn't think I needed it, but then receiving it, it really was that. It, and mm -hmm. then I kind of forgot about it. And then Wednesday came and it was like a great blessing that night. We had had a really busy day as a family mm -hmm. and man, it was, it was awesome. That's really good. That is really good. A few things. I mean, you get the random cards on your desk that just come in and say, Pastor, just want to tell you we love your family, and here's an Audi gift card. I'm thinking about that. One of our people, when we were um, sick with COVID a while back, Door, DoorDash shows up with just a tremendous meal and yeah. didn't even plan on it. Now, this one makes me a little more vain, so no comments from you two guys. <laughs> so a guy in the church, unnamed. I just got a, this is going to make me sound so prideful and vain because you said, did it meet a need in your life? I'm not sure this is a need in my life, but it's a <laughs> desire. So he shows up in a 2021 brand new Corvette. And I said, that's a beautiful car. He goes, you know what I want? He goes, pastors are weather worthy of a double honor. I want you to just take this car and spend the whole weekend driving it around. And so called my buddy, went to a football game in it. And this is like a $500 a day car. And he goes, I just want to tell you, I love you. And just let you know that that'll be a blessing. That's how vain I am. Oh, my random act of kindness. But I remember going, that's just. Did Rhoda let you go buy one? No, Daniel. <laughs> she said no. Did you want so, to? No, I drove by Pastor Messer, who's not with us today. So he drove by and he goes, don't even get any ideas. Doesn't look good for a pastor to be in. <laughs> yeah, that's probably true. So, but that was very, I mean, the kindness of him not needing to do that. He could put it out sure. for $500 a day. And just to say, listen, just a way to tell you and your family, we love you guys. Just, just go enjoy doing that for a weekend. Yeah. No, I love that. Yeah. And we're going to dig deeper into the idea of friendship mm -hmm. this week. And that's really what the conversation today is, is going to be about. It's obviously beyond just random acts of kindness, but, um, I've, I've worked with teenagers for about 20 years and it's so interesting to see that is always, no matter how long I've been doing it, that's always a hot topic for teenagers mm -hmm. is friends. You know, we plan uh, activities and events. The first text that I get is, who's going to be there mm -hmm. yeah. because it, they just travel in tribes and that's just how it operates. What's crazy about friendship is it is the kind of conversation or topic that actually spans generations and age exactly. groups. You know, it's like as a church, you know, we, we a lot of times have a, a picture of a family in our mind, uh, you know, when we're preaching. And so a lot of, and some of it's just our life stage, you know, so we tend to make all these applications and, you know, we're talking about marriage or parenting and it applies to a large group of people, but mm -hmm. inevitably based on life stage, age and season, not everyone. This is one of those topics that it's like the, the, the kids, you know, it's like they're thinking about yep. friends yep. and senior adults. It's like a real felt need and everything in between. Mm -hmm. So Daniel sent me um, a an article uh, that I want to read to you all and then just get your your feedback on it. It's from the New York Post, and the title is Americans Have Fewer Friends Than Ever Before. So I'm just thinking about it. This is written in 2021, uh, kind of in the middle of the, the pandemic. But it says this, with the U.S. population numbering at least 336 million, you'd think we wouldn't suffer for a lack of people in our lives. Nonetheless, a recent survey found that a majority of Americans have fewer friends than they did three decades ago. Survey Center on American Life surveyed over 2,000 Americans in all 50 states. Here's what they found. 49% of those surveyed reported they have less than three close friends. 12% claimed that they have zero friends. They, they relate it to the COVID lockdown is partially to blame. Um, increasingly consumed by work and not having time for friendships. And then studies have also shown that the um, in, in creation of so social media is actually also the blame for feeling isolated. So we know specifically yeah. with social media, right. we have a lot of friends on social media. So thoughts on that, just those that article and the findings of how People are more lonelier than ever, but in a way, we're kind of more connected in, than ever. Yeah, I think, you know, just hearing that, it's not surprising. I think the busyness of our schedules, um, I think, is 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 a lot of it. I mean, we we go, our kids are more involved. We see it in church attendance. You know, the biggest com competitor to to church is travel sports for families, and we're just going, going, going. It's, it's never, we don't slow down. Um, 
Yeah, you know, think mm-hmm. about in our life the the evenings at home mm-hmm. where you're just chilling, and then I think it's there's trust issues. I mean, it's hard to know and trust people. The I think society used to be a lot more. You grew, you lived where you grew up, and you had these long term relationships. Now um, it takes a while to trust, and so I, I think all of those issues play into it, and uh, we have to we have to recognize that we need those friendships Mm -hmm. and we have to be willing to make ourselves vulnerable. We have to be willing to, um, be friends to people. Um, you know, a man that has friends shows himself friendly. Mm -hmm. And, uh, sometimes we have, we, we begin to complain, but we're our own worst enemy in that process. We're not being good friends to others and, uh, that reciprocal relationship. Yeah. So I think it doesn't surprise Mm -hmm. me. I think it's, it's a difficult thing in our culture um, the way our culture runs, it's not conducive to deep relationships. Yeah, you know, I know, uh, I know I've made this joke on Sunday, but, uh, you know, a lot of people say one of the greatest miracles that Jesus did that nobody talks about is he made it into his early 30s and he still had 12 friends. <laughs> and uh, I think this is, th- that survey is, should be for us, it should be eye opening. And what Daniel said is true, not surprising. Because I think we kind of all feel this at a gut level, mm-hmm. but it should be eye-opening that if there's two ways, and we just you know there's there's the the, the way of God, the, way, the the life of Christ, and then there's the way of kind of our culture in this world that is disconnected from God. You know, one of these is resulting in different outcomes. And what is kind of a paradox about the whole thing is two things are true and they clearly don't work together. We are, no question, in the history of humanity, we are more connected than in any other time in human history. I mean, literally, we have a way to stay connected mm-hmm. in, in ways that would, that, would, that would seem unbelievable and unfathomable to people literally 50 or 60 years ago. Mm-hmm. And yet at the same time, I think our world and, and everything around us has shifted us to such a, what I would call a, hyper individualistic way of life that all of our connections have become subservient to this kind of view of the world which is i'm at the center of it and one of the uh the collateral damage to that is is true authentic friendship Mm -hmm. in other words if everything in my life is about me including my relationships inevitably friendship is going to fall by the wayside yeah, and I'm probably, since Pastor's not here today, Tom's not with us, I'm the old guy in the group, which is a weird feeling. Mm. But friendships takes time. Like, yeah. that is a, it is a prime need, it's the root of friendship, is I'm going to have time to spend with you. And if I've seen anything since I was 25 years old, so 30 years ago, we had time in our schedules, we had time in our culture to develop culture, culture friendships. So we'd come over and play basketball and guys weren't on their phones. We weren't checking our phones 63,000 times a day. Um, old 80s song says this, and I love the line. He says, you know, tonight I won't be alone, but that doesn't mean I'm not lonely. So there's just this impact of the world on you. So finally, you're just looking for some me time. And that, I think what Daniel said, he said is we're always connected. I say we always are distracted. Mm-hmm. There's a, such a distraction that we don't take the time to make friends and set apart the distractions mm-hmm. of the world. So is the world more lonely? Absolutely. But they've never been more connected. Mm-hmm. And it's just really dichotomy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that reminds me, I had dinner, my wife and I did it with a couple about a month ago, and I'm, we're talking, I'm just listening to what's going on in their life, and he stops, he says, I can't remember the last time somebody has just listened to me talk mm-hmm. for this amount of time. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. And I think it's, we're missing, mm-hmm. we don't slow down, mm-hmm. we just, we don't listen, we don't invest in each other. And you can't know somebody unless you are willing to spend yeah. time. And that's the, that's the commodity mm-hmm. um, that we trade in in friendships is time more than anything. Yeah. And if but, you just watch culture, I'm sorry. Yeah, Daniel, no, go ahead. So, so if you even just watch, even in our meetings here at the church or even in other ones, there's such a distracted nature to it that we rarely are paying attention to those around us. So there are friend needers and friend makers. And a lot of time the friend makers are so distracted and the friend needers are just, I need someone to pay attention to me and to be a friend to me. So I think that's one of the things, yeah, we, are we probably the loneliest we've ever been as a culture? No question. Yeah. Most distracted. And, and, and then, you know, on top of all of that, if this is where our world ha- has been and is and, and was moving, that, that study was done in 2021, you know, throw in 
a global pandemic and forced oh, isolation yeah. into all of that. Mm -hmm. And you have, t you have 20 years worth of change accelerant in two years. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so where we were already moving, which was toward isolation and toward yeah. loneliness at whatever pace, yeah. it got fast forwarded times 10 over the course of 24 months because of everything related to COVID. Right. So, so in chemistry, a catalyst is something that speeds up the reaction that's already occurring. That's already occurring. Yeah. See, I told you they were smart. I mean, <laughs> come, come on. <laughs> we're getting into chemistry. I'm sorry. <laughs> so how, how is our culture then conditioning us with the wrong perception of friendship? Because I think most people would say, yeah, I've got friends. How are we being conditioned? I'll throw it to you, Tommy. How are we being conditioned as a culture with this perception of true friendship. Yeah, so I'm gonna steal something that Daniel said that I thought was really, I'm gonna, I, I may even throw it to you because I thought what you said was yeah. really insightful of we've lowered the bar of what a friend means. Okay. Why don't you, since you told me that this morning, yeah. I thought it was really good. Well, I think, I think we, and I said this, I think last week, mm -hmm. we fail to underestimate how in small ways, how a redefinition of friendship is shaping the way we think about it. And so for example, use social media, we've already referenced it. Uh, Facebook in particular, which people our age tend to be uh, on. Um, <laughs> You're not on we, TikTok. We have, and, uh... they, they refer to the digital connections that you have on their right. platform as friends. And, you know, if you say, are they really your friends? We all go, oh, no, they're not all really my friends. But you spend a lot of time digitally in something for years and years and years and it's telling you they're your friends they're your friends they're your friends eventually you begin to think well this is yeah. what actual authentic friendship looks mm -hmm. like yeah. it looks like my interactions that i have online and most of us have enough interactions online to go well i don't really know if i want that kind of friendship right. in mm -hmm. my life because half of it's you know kind of unhealthy and, and destructive right but yeah and what he said i wanted him to explain it i think he did a great job with that today and you know when we're talking through this so if he asked me, hey, Tommy, how many friends do you have? Somewhere in the back of my mind, I'd go, and I don't know the number, 3,573 right, right, yeah. friends I think mm -hmm. I have. I have 3,000 acquaintances, but if I really stopped and said, how many friends do I have? And we started talking, the quality is that, is at 2 o'clock in the morning, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. do I have a person I can call mm -hmm. yeah. that will answer the phone? When your life falls apart. Yeah. That's my friend. Yeah. Yeah. And here's the thing, when somebody calls me at 2 a.m., and do I answer the phone? Then I'm being a friend. So raising the bar of what a friend really is, I think what Daniel said and eloquently is we've cheapened what yeah. the word friend means in right. today's society. So, so instead of thinking, well, they liked my Facebook post, they must yeah. be my friend. Yeah. It's more, am I a 2 a.m. friend to somebody? Right. And then do I have 2 a.m. friends? Yeah. That can be a true picture of friendship. Mm -hmm. Right. So we're going to be specifically in John 15 uh, and John 13 and John 15. And um, we're looking at the, the Last Supper and Jesus washing the disciples' feet. But then John 15 is kind of built around the whole idea uh, of the new commandment that we talked about, about loving one another. Um, but it first talks out about the importance of intimacy with the Father, being connected to the vine. Daniel, I'll throw that to you. Why is that an important starting point when it comes to just friendships in general of having just true intimacy with God as our Father? The big thing for me and, and the verse that sticks out in this passage, actually it was in the passage we were in in John 13. It's John 13 starts, it says, The feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew this hour was to come, he, he says this, it says this about Jesus before he washes their feet and before he goes into this whole sequence. He knew that the Father had given everything into his hands. Mm -hmm. He knew he had come from God, and he knew he was going back to God. So therefore, he didn't need anything from people. Mm. He wasn't approaching his relationships from a need-based. He had everything he needed in the, his relationship with the Father. And I think it's so vital for us... Um, our, if we're going to be codependent on somebody or dependent, mm -hmm. we're dependent on God. We are interdependent in our communities. Mm -hmm. That's good. It's re this reciprocal relationship. Mm -hmm. I'm going to forgive you because I'm going to need you to forgive me at some point. Yeah. And, and you know, all the one another's, they are one another, not mm -hmm. to somebody you know, just one way. It's got to be one another's. So I think the, the idea we have to start, the only foundation for healthy friendships, mm -hmm. otherwise... I'm trying to be your friend for my sake, 
Mm -hmm. But whenever I'm abiding with the Father and I have a deep relationship with the Father, then I can be your friend Mm -hmm. for you. And I can get nothing out of it because everything I have, everything I need is in the Father. Mm-hmm. And we need community, but I'm not coming based on out of out of need and, and deprivation looking for you to, to make me whole. There's only one person that can make me whole, mm-hmm. and that's Christ. Yeah. I'm coming to you to who can complement each other so we can be better together, but it is not out of a deficiency. And I think that's why it's so important for us to start with this abiding, because I can't give what I don't have. Mm, And so it either has to be coming from us, or it comes from the source of love and of friendship and community, which is the Father. There's so many conditionalities inside of the passage we just preached, right? So if you abide in the vine, um, you're my friends, if you keep my commandments. There's these these conditional ifs all throughout it. And what Daniel said is so true. So here's what makes this possible. So I'm going to take me and Daniel, for example. We have a different personality. We have mm-hmm. a different temperament, right? So if I abide in the vine. I'm right. You're wrong. There's, there's a time. That, listen, that's one of us right. has to be wrong, and I'm willing to wait. <laughs> so um, what, what happens if we abide? So here's that word. That word abide means to dwell in like a home. That's the intimacy of it. So I'm going to abide in Jesus like he's a home. Then he gives me this love that enables me to be friends with him. And that friendship drives me into community with people around him. And that's where Jesus, that's when he said, it's, it's radical what he's saying here. I'm giving you a new commandment that you've not heard before. That, that love one another. This is so deep-seated. So when Daniel has a moment, and even though he's right all the time, Daniel every now and then has moments. I have moments. Right? Yeah. And so, so Daniel's, so da- and I'm, I'm just being transparent because this is like a friendship around a table. So, I, so Daniel is a g- tremendous talker, right? He talks he always has something to say, and he, and, and he does. Yeah. And so here's the natural Tommy, right? I just want to go, do you think you're right all the time? And I'm like, do you ever shut up? Mm-hmm. Right? And, and <laughs> that's natural me. The right? answer is yes and no. <laughs> <laughs> right. There we go. Right. Now imagine Jesus walking in the room and sitting down here. Here all, all men will know you're my disciples. If you guys can have love one, for, love one for another. And the only way that's possible, Tommy, you have to dwell in me. You have Mm. to be so intimately connected to me that when you see them, you look right through the love of Jesus into their life. Not only that, you'll love them enough to say, I want you to be my friend. Call me at 2 a.m. No greater love hath a man than this. I would lay that on my life for you. That's radical countercultural living. That's what this whole night before Jesus' death tells us. And if I can, like, let me be real transparent. Go. Tommy and I, last week, we had an issue. We were in our friendship. I'm, I'm one when there's conflict or there's a problem. I'm like, conf- the only way through this is we got a bat. We're going to have to fight over it anyway. So let's go through it and let's not work around it. So I can be too direct sometimes. So I came in and said, Hey, this is what's going on. And, we, and I said something in a way that for him, it deeply wounded. And I could tell when we left, I thought, okay. And then because hopefully I'm walking in the mm-hmm. spirit and yeah. abiding. I began to get, get convicted. I'm like, I didn't handle that well. And so we met that afternoon and said, Hey, I think I said that poorly. Yeah. And he goes, well, this is what I heard. And I said, Whoa. And we were able to work through yeah. it. Mm-hmm. But the problem was he doesn't need me to make him whole because mm-hmm. he has the father. Right. Mm-hmm. He needs me in community. We work together. We have a relationship. And, and because I'm in the father, the father's telling me, Hey, you, you sort of blew it. You need to go clean that up. Right. And here's the test of a true friendship. When he walked out the door, I went, I love him more than I did before he walked in the door. Because that's what a Christian community does. Mm -hmm. I see him sometimes as the little red guy on that emotional thing from Disney, whatever the name of that, Inside Out. Inside Out. (laughs) Right. I've never (laughs) explored. (laughs) But but when he walks out, here's what I say, man. The tie that binds us is the love of Jesus. Mm -hmm. And that's that's when what Daniel's saying is so important. Don't cheapen the word what Jesus said. I'm going to call you a friend. And so when he calls us into this radical friendship, it's not, I have 3,000 friends. That's not, what, that's not what the definition of friendship is. And because he was willing in that moment, yeah. he, he, he told me, he said, this is, this is an insecurity and in sure. in a wound that I have. Well, that night, I'm, I'm sitting there, I'm, I'm sitting at home, and I thought, man, I, I, I really, that was not good. So I text, I mean, I'm, yeah. I'm sending encouragement his way and saying, hey, you, if you have this insecurity or this wound, let me let you know that is not true the truth is you are this and and you know called of god and and Mm -hmm. a great leader in our church and and able to speak into that but he had to be vulnerable Mm -hmm. and i had to be 
I had to be aware of what God was prompting me to do so that I could be the hands and feet. Yeah. And he, you know, he had to be sensitive so he could speak truth into my life. And, mm -hmm. and we have to, that's, that's mm -hmm. what friendship is, is yes. as a willing to be vulnerable and a willing to be honest, you know, and I think sometimes we don't want to be vulnerable. We also don't want to be clear and direct uh, with people. Yeah. Oh, it's all good. Or, Hey, you know, you're fine. When really, it's bothering us, but we're not willing to talk about it. And clarity is kindness is a, is yeah. a mantra that I'm try to practice. It's the kindest thing I can do to you is be really clear about how I'm feeling or how, how you're doing and how, what you're doing is impacting others. And there's that depth of communication. And we talked about this as we're preparing for the sermon yesterday. So here's what he really, Jesus says, right? He goes, I've told you everything the father gave me. I've unloaded everything. There's nothing I've held back from you. So there's this transparency in the friendship. Paul would say it this way, have I become your enemy because I'm telling you the truth. So there's this depth inside of friendship that the, the church of Jesus Christ would explode if we really realized how important friendship really was. So Daniel, I'll throw this to you. They're talking about transparency and authenticity. Mm -hmm. Why does that take so much work in a friendship? <laughs> We're really good at surface level stuff. Hey, how you doing? I'm good. I'm doing good too. Did you watch the game this weekend? Mm -hmm. yeah. Why does it take so much work and why sometimes we like to avoid that to not be transparent and authentic with people, which is the key to true friendship? Yeah. Well, you know, I think a, a couple of things quickly pop into my mind. One, I think we said this last week, you know, pride. Yeah. We, we do not want to let <laughs> other people know that we're not perfect yeah. Yeah. or we don't want to let other people know that we don't have all the answers or we don't want to let other people know that we screwed up in the way that we handle the situation. You know, and we just, that, 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 that piece of pride is, is, is still a, something we have to fight against. And it works hard against biblical friendship. And again, I'm not, just to compare the, the reason why it works so great on social media is because social media is kind of built around you propping yourself up. So everybody posts, Instagramable photos of their family and their vacations they're on and all that. And nobody ever sees the mess that's literally on the other side of that camera. Hmm. Um, but but pride's a, a, a huge issue. And then two, because the reality is not everything is this way. Because sometimes we we experience uh, transparency and and it brings a lot of health and healing. Mm -hmm. But also inevitably, when you get into it, it's gonna it's gonna cause us to kind of address kind of the hurt and the pain in our life at some point and at some level. And, you know, we live in a comfortable, convenient culture and everything in our world is saying avoid pain, avoid challenges, avoid confrontation at all costs. And in fact, in many cases, if we could be honest and open with each other and authentic with each other, I like what Tommy said, what Jesus said. Hey, I have shared everything that the Father shared with me, I've shared with you. If we could get to that place in our relationships, we'd find out that actually dealing with or addressing or shining light on the hurts and the pains and the insecurities or whatever they are, it, on the other side of that is health, is mm -hmm. healing, mm -hmm. is all the things that we kind of really want yeah. out of a relationship. It, it, it Oftentimes it is down that road of, of transparency and authenticity in, in our relationships with each other. Mm -hmm. And since you're talking about clarity, clarity is kindness, would you say that clarity and transparency in a friendship actually builds more trust and not less trust when you're clear and honest with people in a friendship? Yeah, I think it, it's hard, but, you know, the <laughs> Proverbs, faithful are the wounds of a friend. Right. Yeah. And, you know, I can think of one of my dear friends. I mean, a long time ago, <laughs> I, I, we were in this auditorium, you know, on Hammond and, uh, he was talking to me about something and I just told him, I said, dude, I think this is a bad idea. Mm -hmm. And I said, there, where there's smoke, there's fire. And it just doesn't feel like this is healthy for you. And he was really, I mean, I found out later that he was mad at me for a long time. But it played out. I happened to be happened to be right. You know, <laughs> uh, I yeah. happened. I, I happened. Yeah. I'll be honest with you. I knew where the story. Was going. <laughs> it would end up with him being right. Yeah. Now. <laughs> so, but he he came to me later and just yeah. said, "Man, I really appreciate you speaking truth yeah. Yeah. to me." It's hard. And, and it is. It, it there are times when you know, I'll be at lunch with somebody. I'm like, mm, I could help you, but you're not. You're not going to listen. Yeah. And I don't know. You know, so does, I don't know that I care enough about you to put myself mm. out there I mean, because mm. they're not a, tr a friend. But if I'm a true friend, I have to be willing to embrace the awkwardness that sometimes that can come and yeah. speak, be willing to speak truth. Because 
and I've told my sons this, the, the depth of my relationship is totally dependent on how much I trust you. And if I don't, mm-hmm. there, there are people who know everything about me. Yeah. That's a small circle of people that, mm-hmm. that I, I can go to and just say, hey, this is what's going on. And mm-hmm. this is this is the part of me that I do not want anybody to see, you mm-hmm. know, and I have to have those people. Mm-hmm. Um, but I trust those people because they've proven themselves worthy of that trust and you know, that they have been faithful and mm-hmm. trustworthy. Mm-hmm. And I think the hard thing in friendships is the time it takes because we've all been burnt you know, whether it was in middle school, um, telling mm-hmm. somebody, oh, I got a crush on that girl, you know, mm-hmm. and we have those wounds where our, our trust was betrayed. And as a, an adult, maybe at the workplace, in the home where you've trusted someone and they failed you, well, then it makes it hard to trust anybody. Mm-hmm. And we have mm-hmm. to be willing, we have to be willing to, to put that trust out there or we will never have deep friends. That's great, Daniel. One of my favorite mm-hmm. theologians, Billy Joel. <laughs> he, he said, in every heart there is a room and it feels like a sanctuary that's safe and strong. But he makes the point by the end of the song that you have to be able to release that sanctuary and allow your heart to be broken to really have deep relationships. So what, that's what Daniel just described. There are people he can, and I've been on those. We've been to Cross Creek yeah. and we've been to restaurants sure. and you go, this is gonna be really hard for me to tell you about me. Bush. And what he's got to be able to do is this is, I have a sanctuary and I'm not handling this well just by myself. Right. Here it is. And I trust you and I love you enough. Here's my heart and you can break it if you want to. And the problem is, is we've all had friends that have disappointed us. They've deserted us. They've defamed us. It makes it really hard to trust. So mm-hmm. we all have to make this decision. Do I trust you enough, Daniel and Joel? Mm-hmm. And this is my heart. Yeah. And you can break it if you want to. And if you prove trustworthy, then you're my friends. So this could be a little bit of a tension point, but I'll throw it out there just considering who's sitting at the table. Why then are pastors so terrible at authentic friendships? <laughs> You're talking yeah. about generally, not generally, not. Right. generally. I just heard all of your <laughs> friendships, but and this could be those in leadership, people listening. Leadership can be lonely, but specifically in church ministry, if there are people in ministry that are listening or watching, um, why are we terrible at it? Sometimes we're we're good at talking about it and teaching people and helping them through conflict resolution, and but why do we struggle with it? You know, you know, Joel. I think this is one of those areas where it's good both if you're in ministry, it's good to have honest conversation about this. And it's good if, as people who are, a lot of people listening would be a part of our faith family, yeah. to know that generally speaking, in, on the if you're in the church world like we are, um, it's a hot topic that pastors really, really struggle um, with with friendship uh, at, at a number of levels and for, and for all different, all different reasons. You know, I think, I think some of that is a lot of just what we've been talking about today. Um, it's easy, uh, to, uh, be a a mile wide and an inch deep. I love, and and I'm not exaggerating about this. Um, I love my favorite thing to do, uh, on Sunday morning outside of preaching is I stand out on the front of the patio and we have a we we are one way into church. We mm-hmm. have you know one primary entrance. So I stand out on the front of the patio and I try to shake or greet every person's hand that 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 walks through through the door. And and it's easy. You do that week after week for years and years and years. And what happens is you you build a lot of very shallow relationships with people. And I don't mean that, I don't mean that yeah. negatively. They're, yeah. they're real, they're good, but they're, they're this deep, you know, they, they're 15 seconds, they're, they're 25 seconds. And over the course of years, you kind of either convince yourself, oh yeah, I've got lots and lots of friends. When the reality is what I mean by that is I shake hands with lots and lots of people <laughs> on Sunday morning. Yeah. And, and it's easy to kind of move through life and you actually have this deficiency. I'm kind of being transparent here. You have this deficiency that you don't feel like other people feel it because you are surrounded with lots mm. and lots of people. I'll say one more thing, mm. and then these guys maybe have kind of their their own kind of taken perspective on it. I, I think, you know, one of the real challenges that pastors don't talk a lot about, but it is true, um, is that uh, people leave the church. 
Yeah. And, and obviously a, a lot of times it's natural, you know, somebody's moving away or whatever that makes perfect sense. There's no pain involved in that other than you might legitimately miss the people. Uh, but then the other thing is, is you have people who, you know, not for bad reasons, but you thought they were with you or, you know, you for years, sometimes at a time. And then, you know, you kind of get the text or you don't get the text, right. you get the call or you don't get the call and, and they're gone. And, and, and then you kind of realize Oh wow! I thought the relationship we had was deeper than apparently it was. You experience that a few times. Not everything is like you know you lay awake at night. Most of the time, it's not the case. But you experience that enough times, and you kind of actually begin to approach all of your relationships, whether you mean mm -hmm. to or not, with this kind of guardedness that hey, I'm going to get to know them and be super friendly <laughs> with them and pastoral with them, but not close enough to them to let them get close enough to me to where eh, there's a chance they might leave. And if they leave, I don't want to be hurt. Mm. And I think pastoral ministry, especially for ministry leaders or really all leaders, you know, that might be listening right now, it's just something we kind of have to have our eyes wide open to. And it's not right or wrong or evil. It's the nature of the beast. And the, the, the challenge comes when we don't acknowledge it and realize is that all of a sudden we can wake up a decade into ministry and go, Oh man, I've got lots of relationships and no friends. Mm -hmm. That's really good. Tommy, mm -hmm. you have thoughts on that? Yeah, I'm the newer yeah. of it, so I have a two-year perspective mm -hmm. on it, right? So I've been around the ministry, but they've been doing it how many years now? I mean, more than a decade. 30 years. Right. So here's my two-year helicopter view that used to be a deacon, that used to be a church yeah. member, right? I think what Daniel said is really, really critically important. So I've experienced that within two years, some came on really quickly. You're investing your life. The Bible tells you as a pastor, you have a watch over their souls. And I mean, I'm there at 2 a.m. I'm there at 3 a.m. I'm investing. Somebody leaves the church and you go, and they just go, well, down the street, they have a bigger service. They have a better band. And I'm like, I just got, I just got mm -hmm. crushed mm -hmm. by this experience. And like Daniel said, you have this natural are you going to do to me what they just yeah, did? Is to everybody going to do that? Is everybody right. going to do that? So there is a, I don't want to use the word insecurity, but there's a self protection from that type of, I'm going to depart regardless of how you invested in my life. I think that's one really, really thing. I think um, in some cases, you're saturated all day long mm -hmm. with it yeah. to where it's nothing from my office. Somebody walk out, I get my Bible to study. The next person walks in and goes, I have a real problem. I go, okay, great. So by the time I get home, here's what I'm not going to do. I'm not going to lose my family over a church. And so that becomes hard to make friends. So why, why are pastors hard? They're saturated all day with people. They've been wounded by people. And I think the New Testament says, it tells church members, and I took this very seriously when I was a church member and a deacon, you behave yourself in a way that makes your overseer glad. There's a happiness. Mm -hmm. And I think if the church of Jesus Christ, and listen, we have 98% wonderful, wonderful people that do this well, mm -hmm. but there's a group of people that will wound you and they will push you and they will grade you. I told you recently, maybe it was recently, I said, it's the, it, nobody in my old job, I went, well, I think this is a chemistry. And they go, that's wrong. Yeah, yeah, and you're an idiot yeah, if you do that. Yeah. Pastors are seen that way. I mean, if you, and, and I made a joke and this is funny, mm -hmm. in one of our venues, I went and somebody said, and this was, they were minute funny. I walked in, they said, it's too hot in here. I said, okay, great. So I started walking around the back toward the thermostat and somebody else called me and said, if you touch the thermostat, I'm leaving the church. And they meant it funny. But I went, <laughs> now there's a microcosm. Yeah. I'm like, there. so, so sometimes I think the friendship attachment, it's just difficult yeah. due to saturation. And, and the final thing, I think this is maybe the key for me. You feel like any deficiency you have is defining of you. Yeah. yeah. And that defining will cost you your pastorate. Mm -hmm. You can't be real. You can't say, I struggle with this. So I came in two years ago saying, you know what? I'm going to set the bar so low on what you should think of me that I'm not going to let what you think is a deficiency define me. So yeah. guess what? I'll tell you up front, every sermon you ever hear me preach, if you come in, I'm going to say, guess what? I got a problem with pride that I am dealing with daily. I have thought life problems. And I don't want you, if you find out, I want you to go, yeah, he's been telling us that. Yeah. Not, oh, I thought you were perfect. And mm -hmm. I think pastors have self-protected in that yeah. way. And that makes it really hard for them to be friends. Yeah. Daniel, 30 years, what, what have you experienced with this? So I think two things I think are, are true and echo, agree with everything that's been said. I think the idea that it takes time and um, a back and forth, a mutual investment in relationships. And 
especially if you're a teaching pastor and you're speaking every week, you're, you're making yourself very vulnerable and you're telling stories about you. And so everybody in the audience knows us much deeper than we know people in the audience. Right. Mm-hmm. And so they feel like, man, yeah, I got this great relationship with Pastor Daniel, Pastor Tommy, Pastor Tom. Mm-hmm. And we're like, I don't even know your name. You know, and I know you sit back there and you're here 30 weeks out of the, out of the year, but I don't know anything about your, I don't even know what you do for work. Mm -hmm. And I can say, Hey, Bill, how you doing? And how's the kids? We can do small talk, but they know us so much better. And so we, it's sort of like any public figure. I think celebrities feel that pain and not that we're celebrities as pastors, but we are public figures and we, we are very vulnerable many times in our teaching. Mm-hmm. And so that creates this inequity in relationships mm-hmm. um, that we we are by default and how we behave and what our job requires of us, um, our ministry. I don't know if we should call it a job, but anyway, yeah. uh, that, that what it requires of us is to it it feeds mile wide, inch deep mm-hmm. friendships. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The other thing is, and it's em- emotional for me. Mm-hmm. So Sorry. right now I'm it's meeting. Fine. It's fine. Yeah. I'm meeting with a counselor right now trying to work through some of these things yeah. because for 30 years, I mean, my my oldest son's a church planner and yeah. he's a year in. And um, I remember six months in, he came and he says, mom and dad, I mean, this person just left and they were on my leadership mm. team yeah. and wounded. Yeah. And um, somebody there, they had lied about him and his wife. And, and my wife looks at him and goes, yep. Mm. Mm. And, then, mm. and for me, it hit. I'm like, she's felt this pain too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we've been there. And and so, like right now, I mean, literally, I'm I'm writing, I'm having to journal some of these these about this topic mm. and and how do we how do we make ourselves vulnerable? Yeah. Mm. And 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 so I know I feel it. And and I think when you look in the room and you talk about people who they've had a spouse betray them, mm-hmm. they've had friends betray them, they've been cut down in the workforce by somebody who wanted their job. Yeah. yeah, and I feel it in pastorally, but I think everybody yeah. in our congregation, these wounds, if we don't learn how to grieve, that's what my counselor's working with me. He's like, you gotta go through these stages of grief. Yeah. And you can't celebrate the friendships you've had yeah. because you're still mad or still hurt. Yeah. And you know, you gotta go you go from ang- sad to angry to to you know, man, I really wish this would have been different mm-hmm. to the grieving, and then you can reflect and appreciate what you had yeah. and so he's having me helping me work through it because sometimes you just you don't know how to grieve right. because mm-hmm. they're still you know these people mm-hmm. that have hurt you are still they're still part of your church or yeah. they live in our city and you know it, or they just ghosted you on a sunday that you haven't seen them in three years because this was this deep person mm-hmm. who was invested in your church you invested in them and they just ghost you yeah and you're like what just happened i thought we were tight yeah. and there's no how do you deal with this yeah. and i think um and what happens, it begins to really bleed over, mm-hmm. yeah. you know? And so now I'm, I'm getting ready to turn 50 and I mean, 30 years, I mean, that's what I'm, I'm working through, man, I've got some wounds I've got to deal mm-hmm. with. And I think for, and I can't have healthy relationships for this last half of my life. We'll mm-hmm. go with half. So <laughs> Good that, luck with that. So, or third <laughs> or whatever that is. Um, I can't, I, I've got to deal with some of these. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think that is true for everybody that listens to us on saying when I think when we teach about these friendships, we have to help people. I, I can't just move on mm-hmm. from wounds and friendship. I really have to, to trust this and I have to be abiding in the father. And then I have to, as much as possible, if I have ought against my brother mm-hmm. if I, to go and try and bring closure to those things. And so I think it's, it's really um, a hard thing mm-hmm across the board. Yeah. You know, I really appreciate you sharing that. I mean, this is a public venue, right? This sure. is, yeah. that's hard to share. Yeah. And that's yeah. difficult to say, here I am a pastor leading mm-hmm. and I'm seeing a counselor to help me through mine. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And here's what, here's what I think Paul said. I think Daniel, it's Philemon. I believe it's Philemon where Paul said he wasn't ashamed of my chain. Yeah. He, he wasn't ashamed to see me how I was, where mm-hmm. I was. Right. And then Paul said this, but he often refreshed me. Sure. Mm-hmm. That's what a friend does. So we've all had friends see us. We could have even made a mistake. I think of one in my own life. I made it maybe a mistake in what I handled it. The friend said, I'll see you later. Yeah. Done. That 
That's not the biblical pattern of friendship. Mm -hmm. The biblical pattern of friendship is when Daniel just said, I have hurts in my life. When these microphones go off, me and him ought to be going, how can we help you through mm -hmm. that? Because we mm -hmm. love you. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm not embarrassed by your chain. I'm not embarrassed by where this found you. We're going to run to you in the midst of your need. That's what a friend is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That was really good. Really good for me to sit here and listen to and just to hear what you all have experienced or been through. It's an, it's an encouragement to me for sure. So 60 second question, each of you, I'll throw it your way. <laughs> I, there's nothing I can answer in 60 <laughs> seconds. <laughs> Go ahead, Just give it a shot. Just a couple more questions, but Billy here's Joel. one. That's my I know there's many different people that are listening and they may be going through their mind, hearing all of this, but then, you know, kind of thinking through um, where they're at. 60 seconds, I'll come to each of you. What do you say to the person that may be in your congregation, maybe someone that you know that just says, I don't need friends. Mm -hmm. I'm good. I don't need friends. So here's what I would say. This would be me individually, not, not speaking for Tommy <laughs> or Daniel. I know exactly how you feel. Uh, my personality is yeah. wired in such a way. I'm an introvert. I have a very public part of what I do in ministry. Um, but I am perfectly happy alone or with my family. And eventually what I would say is this, eventually you, you realize that God's wired you for community, that we've been made in the image of God. We talked about this last week. And, and while you may have a personality, you know, that, that doesn't have the same kind of felt need as Tommy does or Daniel does or whatever, that's okay. God made you that way. It doesn't change kind of at the core that you were made to be in, in community and, and to deny that part of who you are is to deny a, a fundamental reality of how God made you to thrive and flourish kind of as, as part of a healthy life. That's good. Tommy, I don't need friends. Okay. So Daniel answered that perfectly, right? Everybody needs friends. Like I, I can be like Daniel, but I really thrive on people. I, I thrive on friendships. I, I thrive on you liking me. I mean, I, that's a really deep wound if you don't like me. And I'll find any way around it to make you like me. I'll <laughs> compromise if you need me to like me. But, but here's what I'd say. There's two, two ways to look at this. The Bible addresses it from both, both perspectives. If you, if you want to have friends, then you have to be friendly. And so if you're sitting there today listening, going, man, I don't have enough friends, you need to evaluate, am I being friendly? Am, am I being friendly on this end? But my biggest message is to this. Us that have consumed the truth of God for 30 years and 20 years and 10 years, are you actively looking to make friends and look for people that are wounded along the journey to come alongside of them. My favorite band, I get made fun of it all the time. My favorite Christian band is Casting Grounds. Like got a book signed yeah. by Mark Hall in my office that yeah. I'm like, I got a book by Mark Hall in my office. So he has this, this song on his earlier albums. Does anybody see them? Like, does anybody know these people are going down and needing friends? Shame on us as mature Christians. If mm -hmm. we're content just to sit at home and go, I don't need to make any more friends. Mm -hmm. There are brothers and sisters that are desperate for friends out there. Quit living for yourself. Get out there and make some friends. Hmm. Mark Hall listens to our podcast, actually. No, I don't think so. <laughs> yeah. What's up, Mark? Yeah, for the record, Tommy went a minute and 20 seconds. I so, knew it. So. See, there you go. There it is. <laughs> and start the clock. Okay. Right. So for me, two things. One, you will need friends at some point. Yeah. Everybody, there comes a point where you need a friend. And if you haven't done the work, of having friends when you need one. You can't make a friend when you need it. You have to be building friendships. Even if it's <laughs> you, you don't feel like it, you will. Hmm. Um, hmm. I think that's just, we all hit that point in our life where we need a friend. And if you don't have one, it's too late. Hmm. Mm -hmm. um, two, you can't obey the one another of Scripture a script, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. without... That's a good point. If you say, well, I don't need a friend. I just need Jesus. Well, you can't follow Jesus without friends. How do you love one another? Yeah, because the we went from religious performance to relational. I mean, the hallmark of the New Testament faith is the one another's of Scripture. Mm -hmm. That is how we worship. Mm -hmm. And we can't do that without friends. You, you know, Joel, we tend to, this is not part of my 60s. I was going right? to say, this hold is, on, hold on. This is an extra <laughs> little, little freebie right here. We, we tend to be... Um, just in general, we, we tend to thrive or, or, or be driven towards the extremes. And we kind of find ourselves in one of two ditches. One ditch is, and this is also like personality type. I, I got to be friends with everybody. <laughs> and eventually at some point you just come to the conclusion, I can't be best friends with everybody in my life. It's impossible, you know. And so then sometimes if we 
discover that, then we decide, well, then the only other solution is the other ditch, which is I don't need to be friends with anybody. Mm. And both of those are kind of just unhealthy, unsustainable realities. And that's, that's what Daniel and Tommy were saying. At some point, you are going to need a friend. Mm. And it's not that you have to be friends with every single acquaintance or, or person in, in your life. But you also can't live on the other ditch, which is which is emptiness and loneliness and, and, and isolation. Both of those can be destructive, uh, you know, in their own ways. Yeah. Well, we're going to wrap it up today with this final question. And this may sound like a plug for what we have happening in our church ministry, but I think it's valuable for us to talk about if anyone's engaged in a, uh, the body of Christ, the church family, is that there is built-in gospel community um, that happens at pretty much every church, specifically at ours. We, we call it groups. We want to grow together in groups. And there's a saying that goes with and maybe you've heard it, it's this idea of circles are better than rows. So we sit in rows every Sunday in a big congregational worship service. Why is it important to be in a circle of, of friends, a gospel community of people where you can be known and cared for and held accountable? And Tommy, I'll throw it to you first. Yeah, real quick answer on that one. I think we've almost covered that entire, it's, it's important to be known. It's mm -hmm. important to be in a community where people know your needs. Uh, Francis Schaeffer also said that the Christian community is the final apologetic. We can explain the Bible, we can get theologically deep, but you can't deny Christian community when you see it functioning correctly. At our church, we put them in groups based on similar passions, similar life stages, and that is the biggest proof that Jesus is active is when you see a group within a church functioning. So listen, it's you need to be in a group for your health, for your family's health. I mean, there's there's so many ways to say that, but really group life is incredibly important. You know, Joel, I, I say this, I feel like I just have some things that I repeat to our church over and over again, and this is one of them. Church, my favorite description that you see in scripture of church is always is the descriptions that are in relational language. We're, we're a body, we're many members, Jesus says it in John chapter 15, we're friends, and and it, it is a family. And when you understand, that's what I love actually where this series is going, you know, the, the first conversation we had about loving one another was really just kind of understanding what that means. The The series now is bending hard because scripture mm -hmm. bends as it, as it begins to talk about that. So how do you do it? It, it shifts hard into the context of, of community that, that you were not made for yourself and yourself alone, uh, that, that to effectively live out this command is going to be in the context of, of relationships with other people. Yes. in in our church, uh, we, we program that or we try yeah. to facilitate that through serving together, through uh, being on mission and outreach together, through growing together in group. And the key word there on all three of those, you know, we, we have this strategy, worship together, mm -hmm. uh, grow together, serve together, go to get together. Mm -hmm. And, um, and it's fundamental to, to, to how God made us and what he, what he's called us to do to live out to this new commandment. Yeah. And, to follow up that real quick, right? So when he's writing this, Jesus is in a group and he's sitting in a circle. Yeah. There you go. That's a great spot to end it. <laughs> I can't say much more than that. Nope. That's, a, that's really good. <laughs> well, in the words of Woody and Buzz from Toy Story, you've got a friend in me. There you go. Thank you so much for watching today or listening. Uh, we encourage you to subscribe to our podcast. Uh, new podcasts are posted every Monday morning. Again, if this has been a blessing to you or maybe there's a topic or something that you would like uh, for us to talk about, feel free to send us a message or drop a comment below. Thank you so much for being a part of the Trinity Podcast where we want to help everyday people discover an extraordinary life with God. We'll see you next time.